This week we're going to talk about chapter three, which is the methodology of cross-cultural research. The goals of cross-cultural research, there's four goals. The first is to describe major findings of the research. Then we want to explain why there are differences or even why there are similarities. But a lot of times our goal is to explain why there are differences. Then we want to disseminate the received data and the interpretations that we're making. We want to predict factors. And then cross-cultural research is usually divided into two categories, quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative research is going to be the systematic investigation of psychological phenomenon by means of statistical or mathematical data and various computational techniques. When we use quantitative research, a researcher can basically measure the emotional stability of two groups of managers, one in Japan and the other in France. We can compare the strength of organizational skills of male and female applicants for a job, or we can even compare and contrast the collectivist habits of two cultural groups. So this involves recording, measuring, classification, assessment, and interpretation. And this is going to be the type of research that we would use if we are interested in establishing any types of similarities, differences, or other statistical relationships that occur between two variables or even among several variables. With quantitative research, we usually use the measures of central tendency. And the measures of central tendency tend to indicate the locations of score distributions on a variable, meaning it's going to describe where most of our distribution is located. There's three major measures of central tendency, mean, median, and mode. Our mean is going to indicate the mathematical central point of a distribution of scores. So think of this as basically the average. Our median is going to score in the distribution located at the 50th percentile. So if you were to take all of the scores and you were to line them up from lowest to highest, the one that is directly in the middle, that score is your median. And then our mode is going to be our most frequently occurring score in a distribution. So if we have five scores, let's say one, two, three, two, and two, our mode is going to be two. It's going to be the score that occurs most frequently. Along with our measures of central tendency, we also have measurement scales. And there are four main types of measurement scales when we're talking about quantitative research. The first is nominal, meaning that each score does not indicate an actual amount. It does not measure any rank or order. It's used mostly for identification purposes. So an example of this would be, what language do you speak? What is your gender? What is your political party? Are you a dog or a cat? So it's strictly IDing, identification. It doesn't have any amount, it doesn't have any rank, it doesn't have any order. Our ordinal is going to be scores that designate a rank order that may indicate a subject's preference, an attitude, or opinion. So think about average, below average, above average, or you might place in a swim meet one, two, or three. With intervals, this is going to be each score that in indicates some amount, and there's going to be presumably an equal unit of measurement separating each score. So this is going to be similar to a Likert scale where you give something a score, one, two, three, four, or five, and it actually means something. 
And then there's ratio. With ratio, the scores are going to reflect the true amount of the present variable. Zero is going to truly mean zero amount of the variable is present. This cannot include negative numbers. So think an example of this would be amount of time watching television, an actual number of minutes, or the actual number of hits in a baseball game. When we take a quantitative approach to research, especially cross-cultural research, we tend to be looking for either links or differences. Basically, we're looking at correlations. We visited correlations a little bit in chapter two in the critical thinking. When we talk about correlations, it's gonna be our relationship between two variables or even among several variables, but it's usually two variables. We can have either a positive correlation or a negative correlation. With a positive correlation, both variables will go in the same direction. They will both either decrease or they will both increase. When there is a negative correlation, the variables are going to go in opposite directions. They will not be going in the same direction. If, one, if in one set of data, variable X is low, variable Y is also low in a positive correlation. If variable X is high, variable Y is high, again, in a positive correlation. If in another data set, variable A is low and variable B is high, or variable A is high and variable B is low, we will have a negative correlation. So with correlation coefficient, which is the number we get, this is the number that's going to summarize and describe the type of relationship that is present and then the strength of that relationship between variables X and Y. Now, because we can have a positive or a negative correlation, our correlation coefficient can be anywhere between negative 1 and 1. The larger the absolute value, closer to 1 or negative 1, the stronger the relationship. The closer we get to zero, the weaker the relationship. And then always remember that correlation is not causation. We cannot, just because we come up with a positive or negative correlation between two variables does not mean we can actually figure out which caused which. When preparing for preparation for a cross-cultural study, there are a couple of major steps that we have to visit. And I think I went one too far. I guess I did not. Qualitative approach. I apologize. I actually skipped over one in my notes. Let's start with qualitative approach. We talked about quantitative. Now we're going to talk about qualitative. With qualitative research, this is research that does not involve measurement or statistical procedures. It's usually conducted in a natural setting. We are usually observing something. Another form of qualitative research is psychobiographical research. This is a longitudinal, longitudinal analysis of particular individuals usually outstanding persons, celebrities, leaders. And what we do here is we actually give a biographical timeline approach to the research. Now with quantitative and qualitative methods, they're not usually mutually exclusive. And in a lot of cases, psychologists will choose to incorporate both in their research. And here are our major steps for preparation. When we are preparing for a cross-cultural study, the first thing that we have is our case in point on page 80. These are the steps and the approach when designing cross-cultural research. So we have an application-orientated strategy. This is an attempt to establish the applicability of research findings 
obtained in one country or culture and compare it to other countries or cultures. So basically, we're gonna test it in a particular cultural context and then test it in different cultural settings. So another type of strategy that we have is the comparativist strategy. With comparative, comparativist strategy, this is an attempt to find similarities and differences in statistical measures in a, different, in a bunch of different samples of culture. So an example is if a Canadian researcher establishes that the education level of family members, along with the size of the family, are negatively correlated on the national level, then the researcher would use a comparativist strategy to identify similarities or differences in the relationships between education and family size in samples of other countries. When we are preparing for any type of study, any type of research, we have to do sample selection. When we're doing sample selection, there's gonna be three different types of strategies for sample selection. The first is going to be availability or convenience sampling. This is where a researcher is going to choose a culture by chance or because the researcher's professional or personal contacts are able to be used. So that's availability is we're doing it by chance. The convenience sampling means we are able to we are able to, as researchers, have access to certain samples. There's systematic sampling. This is where we're going to select national or ethnic samples according to a theory or some type of theoretical assumption. And then finally, there's gonna be a random sample. This is when a large sample or a group are randomly chosen and anybody has an equal chance of being selected in that research sample. So what this all leads us to is a representative sample. A representative sample is gonna be a sample having characteristics that are gonna accurately reflect the characteristics of the population that's being studied. Now, in general, what's gonna happen is the smaller the sample size, the greater the sampling error, and the greater the result of chance factors. The larger the sample size, the lower the sampling error that we're gonna have. When we're doing observations, observations in cross-cultural psychology happen quite often. And what we do here is we have an observation. This is the acquisition of information about identifiable variables from a primary source. And we can do two different types of observation. We can do naturalistic observation, which is where we're recording people's behavior in their natural uh, environment with little or no personal intervention. Or we can do a laboratory observation. This is where we record people's behavior in an environment that's created by the researcher. Now, when we do any type of observation, they can be both structured and unstructured. So an example from your book that we did is during World War II, between 1940 and 1945, the British and the American intelligence, they bugged several thousand German and Italian prisoners of war to gather secret recordings of their conversations with one another in hopes of basically discovering important military secrets. Now, these recordings of uncensored conversations also revealed many stunning facts about people's war experiences that they may not have normally shared. So the historians and the psychologists who studied them were able to observe how captured soldiers and, op and officers spoke about their time in the war, specifically of killing and torturing others without regret or remorse, 
or boasting about the extreme level of violence they had inflicted during the war, which is not something that they would have been able to observe in a laboratory observation. It had to be in a natural habitat. Another type of cross-cultural method, and this is usually tend to be used in quantitative research, are survey methods. So surveys are the investigative method that are, that's used where groups of people answer questions about their opinions or the behavior. They can be open-ended and be used in qualitative research, but a lot of times they're more commonly multiple choice questions or assigned to a Likert scale type scoring system. There can be direct surveys. These are gonna be the type of surveys where the interviewer maintains or can maintain a direct communication with the respondent and is then able to provide feedback, repeat a question, or even ask for additional information. Now, most common of direct surveys are face-to-face -face or telephone surveys. There's also indirect surveys. These are the type of surveys where a researcher's personal impact is very small because there's no direct communication between the respondent and the interviewer. So these are typically written and handed in, mailed or emailed to the respondents in their homes, classrooms, or workplaces. And the biggest type of indirect survey that has come about is the use of SurveyMonkey or online surveys where everything is completely confidential and anonymous to the point that the people being surveyed usually don't even know who the surveyor is, who the researcher is. Experimental studies are another form of study in cross-cultural psychology. And experimental methods, they allow psychologists to determine how an individual's behavior and experience can vary across different situations. And what happens is the experiments, which are an investigative method where a researcher alters a variable to detect a specific change in the subject's behavior, attitude, or emotion. But these experiments they give the researcher transparent and verifiable procedures. So not only do they ask individuals about how fast they make decisions, for example, but they also test the speed in various experimental conditions. So experiments come with two types of variables, an independent variable and a dependent variable. An independent variable is the condition that the researcher will control or manipulate while the dependent variable is the aspect of human activity that is studied and expected to change under the influence of the independent variable. A really easy um, experiment to understand would be like a drug experiment. So you would have two groups. One group is on, let's say we're looking at the effects of antidepressants on happiness. We'd have two groups. One group is the control group. The second group is taking the antidepressant. That's the independent variable. Either a placebo or the, or the antidepressant is the independent variable. That's what we're controlling or manipulating. Our dependent variable is the, the effect on happiness. We're not changing that at all whatsoever. A few other types of research that are usually used in cross-cultural psychology, we can have content analysis. This is a research method that systematically organizes and summarizes both the manifest, so what was actually said or written, and the communication, the meaning of what was said or written. So the researcher here will usually examine transcripts of conversations, interviews, television or radio programs, letters, newspaper articles, other forms of communication. There also may be a focus group methodology. This is a survey method that's used intensively in both academic and marketing research. The most common use of this method is a procedure in which group respo groups respond to specific social, political, or marketing messages. 
So think if you've gotten lately with the election coming up in November, a text message that says, can you take our two minute survey? I get them all the time. That could potentially be a focus group methodology. Usually it contains about seven to 10 participants and these participants are either experts or could represent potential buyers, viewers, or any other type of customer. And then finally, we have a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is the quantitative analysis of a large collection of scientific re results in an attempt to make sense of a diverse selection of data. So this method often shows results that are difficult to see in individual studies because what we do is we take a bunch of different individual studies and we put them all together into one great big study. And then finally, there's gonna be two approaches when it comes to cross-cultural psychology. A lot of times we're gonna be comparing two phenomena. So think of how similar are people in Tokyo and New York in terms of their thoughts, their emotions, their motivation. So theoretically, there are two answers to this question, and each one is going to reflect a distinct approach to cross-cultural psychology. So the first is the absolutist approach or the universalist approach. This means that a view in cross-cultural psychology that psychological phenomenon are basically going to be the same in all cultures. So an example of this would be honesty is honesty. Uh, abuse is abuse. Depression is depression. It wouldn't matter where, when, or how the research studies are. The psychological phenomenon is going to be universal. And then finally, there's going to be a relativist approach. This is where we're going to have a view in cross-cultural psychology that psychological phenomenon should be studied only from within a culture where these phenomena occurred. And there are absolutely different areas of psychological phenomenon that do not occur in other cultures and are unique to that specific culture. And so this is a figure from your book that you can see that just shows that there is an integrative, it is a continuous variable between the absolutist and the relativist. We're going to have kind of that continuum or that spectrum that it can be on. But on one side, we're going to have absolutist, which is going to be universal similarities. And on the other side, we're going to have relativist, which is unique differences. I hope you all enjoyed chapter three. If you have any questions, as always, please reach out. Don't forget your exam is going to cover chapter one, two, and three.